Hi, this is Dory Clark. I am here live with William Green, and this is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. We're so excited to have you here, and welcome. Uh, we are going to be talking today about William's new book, which is called Richer, Wiser, Happier. Who doesn't want to be those things? William Green, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. It's a delight to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much. So if you are tuning in here for the first time, let me mention, and for you regulars you know, please type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're calling in from so we can say hello. We're so happy to have you here. And so, William, my first question to you, you so you've written this book, which focuses on taking lessons from the world's greatest investors and applying them to life and giving us lessons about how all of us can learn to be richer, wiser, happier as a result of these lessons. I am curious, one of the themes that you talk about a lot in the book, which I'm a fan of, I have a book coming out in September called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, uh, so you bang this drum as well, is the importance of long-term thinking as we think about all the investments, whether financial or time, that we make in our lives. Can you talk a little bit about that? What is the role of long-term thinking? Yeah, I think it's profoundly important. It's one of those superpowers. If when everyone else is becoming more and more short-term and they're being constantly buffeted by, by tweets and Facebook messages and, and meetings, if, if you can actually focus on things that as one of the great investors I interviewed called things that have a longer shelf life, it's a tremendous advantage. And so there's, there's someone I wrote about called Nick Sleep, who's very remarkable, who had this extraordinary record at a fund called Nomad, where he beat the market by something like 800 percentage points over 13 years. And what he was essentially doing was setting up his life so that it was, it was counter to our, our current culture where everything is very short term. And, and even the companies that he invested in had this tremendous emphasis on being long term, on deferring gratification. And so, for example, a perfect example of it would be Costco or, or Amazon, which both had this same model where instead of trying to maximize their profits in the short term, they kept saying, how do we pump back more and more value to the customer? How? So they were perfectly happy to defer gratification, not to, not to enrich themselves as, as quickly as possible, um, but actually to create this kind of flywheel that came from, from sharing their scale economies as they got bigger. And I think this turns out to be one of the power principles of life, whether it's how you structure your own personal habits, the companies you invest in, what, what you read, the way you think, the way you, the way you set up your ecosystem so that your information diet is actually more long term. So one of the things this guy Nick Sleep did is he would say, well, I don't want to be focusing on, on things with a super short shelf life, like is this company going to beat its earnings estimate by a, a penny in 12 weeks? He said, that's the most perishable information. Why should I focus on that? What I want to focus on is what's the destination for this company in 10, 15, 20 years? And are they, are they doing the inputs that are going to get them there, like treating their customers better, treating their suppliers well, uh, providing more value to people? And, and he has a wonderful phrase for this where he calls it destination analysis where you say, well, so what's, what's the destination? And you can, you, can, you can apply this to your own life. And in a somewhat morbid way, I said, well, so if the destination is my funeral, how do I want people to remember me? And what are the inputs that I have to put in? Am I gonna treat people decently? Am I gonna misbehave? And, and you can, or if you want a healthy life, what are the, what's, what's the destination? Well, so I better change the way I eat. I better exercise more. I better meditate more. And so this very simple idea of deferring gratification and focusing on the long-term destination and what inputs will get you there turns out to be a very profound principle in, as we've discussed, investing, business, and actually your habits and, and your information diet. And th those are the sort of principles I'm interested in where they actually span all of these different areas. There's not really a distinction between being a wise investor and a wise human being. That's fascinating, William. Thank you so much. And I just want to say hi to some of the great folks who are tuning in live here. We have Catherine from Toronto. We have uh, Anna from Vancouver, Diane from Cleveland, Gail from North Carolina. 
Hi, Gail. We have Mel from Chester, Chesterfield, Missouri. Antonio's from Greece. We have a LinkedIn friend from Portland, Oregon. Margaret from Jacksonville. And Juhi is here. We're so glad to have all of you. And if you're just tuning in, please type into the chat box so we can say hi. Uh, we are glad you were here. And we are going to be taking your questions for William Green, author of Richer, Wiser, Happier. So please feel free to type them in. We'd like to hear what's on your mind. So William, I'd like to actually have you expound a little bit more on a point that you just made, which is that the central principle of your book is that that essentially the lessons that we learn from good investing principles are applicable in all areas of our lives. And I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about that? In what way are they transferable? And perhaps are there ways that you've applied them yourself to be able to achieve the, the better life outcomes that we're all seeking? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say, Dory, I'm also loving the fact that your cats are bounding behind you. It, it's it's great. It's it, it's, uh, it's really giving me pleasure. So if I smirk intermittently, you'll know that's the reason. Um, well, one of my favorite principles in the book actually comes from Charlie Munger, who's this 97-year-old polymathic genius who's been Warren Buffett's partner for the last 40 years. And I interviewed Munger in Los Angeles. And it, it's a pretty terrifying prospect, actually, interviewing Munger, because he's He's fearsomely clever, and he's known as this great curmudgeon. And so um, you're, you're sort of terrified that he's going to see through you and realize that, that you don't actually know what you're doing. And, and, and I, I Buffett said that Munger has the, the greatest 30-second mind in the world, that he can, he can figure out the, the essence of everything before you even finish the sentence. And what's really fascinating about Munger is that here you have one of the brightest guys alive, and yet what he focuses on is, is what he calls reducing standard stupidities, which is a really fascinating concept that, again, like deferred gratification, has tremendous ramifications for everything that we do, whether it's how we invest or, or how we live, how we think. And so one of the things that he does is, inspired by a 19th century mathematician, a, a guy called Carl Gustav Jacobi, who said, invert, always invert. What Munger does is he's constantly inverting. And so he says, well, if I want to be a really great investor, let me first ask, what would it take for me to be a terrible investor? And so you look at all of the things that terrible investors do, um, and then you say, yeah, let me not do them. And so think of the ways that, that all of the investors we know, and, and most of us have done these things as well ourselves at some point, um, think of the things that we do wrong, right? We, uh, we get caught up in fads. We get caught up in the emotion of the moment. We, we invest in things that we don't really understand. We, um, we, we, we invest borrowed money that we can't afford, or we, have, we, we invest in companies where there's no margin of safety. It's, uh, they're too expensive, they're overpriced, they're faddish. So these are the sort of things that Munger would look at and simply say, well, if I can systematically reduce standard stupidities, then I'm already so far ahead of the crowd. And what's fascinating is if you apply that in your life, it's equally powerful. So, so there was another great investor I interviewed, a guy called Tom Gaynor, who's a wonderful guy who's the co-CEO of a company called Markel, which is a Fortune 400 company, very successful business. And Tom said, well, look, I have a very happy marriage. He's, he's been married to this woman who he met when he was 15, and they went for their first date at the custard stand that his parents drove him to with this, this girl who's a, a Presbyterian minister's daughter. And you know, they've been married forever, have a lovely, lovely relationship. And he said, if, if I go out drinking and I'm in a bar and I'm not with my wife, I have to apply Munger's inversion principle. And I have to say, well, what's a really stupid thing to do? I don't want to mess up my marriage. So, so let me have two drinks, not 10 drinks. And so it sounds really simple, but actually, if you focus systematically on simply reducing standard stupidities on your life, in, in your life, it's so powerful. I mean, think about think about even a period like COVID, where you just think, well, okay, so if I'm if I'm relatively patient, if I wear a mask, if I if I get vaccinated, if I keep my distance from people, I'm going to survive this period almost certainly. If I'm reckless, if I if I go out drinking, if I go out, you know, if I go night clubbing, eh, you know, maybe I'll be lucky, maybe it'll be fine, but. But I think the approach of a lot of these great investors is that they're applying this sort of generalized rationality in every area of their life. And so you can get away with being stupid and reckless sometimes, but if you're stupid and reckless over long periods of time in the markets, in your relationship, in your habits, in the way you eat, sooner or later, you know, in the way you drive, in the way you ski, 
sooner or later, time is the enemy of really bad, dumb habits. And it's the friend of really good habits, which would compound over time. Such a great point, William. Thank you very much. I'm Dory Clark. I am here on behalf of Newsweek with our weekly show, Better. And our guest this week is William Green, the author and journalist. His new book is Richer, Wiser, Happier. If you want to learn more about William and his work, just go to williamgreenwrites.com. And if you'd like to make sure you never miss one of our weekly episodes of Better, follow me at doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. Go to that tab and you can subscribe to my weekly LinkedIn newsletter, which will remind you about these just hit the subscribe button under the photo. So we'd also like to say hi to some of the great folks who have joined us. We have friends from Colorado Springs. Hi, Renee. We have uh, users from Baltimore, Henrietta from London. We have uh, Adeniran from Nigeria, Ranjit from Delaware, Mary from Kokomo, Nelia from Calgary, and more. It is an international crew, and we love it. So, William, a topic that I am interested in, and I'm sure perhaps many people here who have been reading headlines lately uh, will be, you talk about the importance of long-term thinking, which I absolutely agree with. It seems like over the past year during COVID, things have gone a little bonkers in the market. We've been seeing all this uh, this uh, GameStop type situations where uh, crazy things are are happening on on internet message boards. Cryptocurrency has exploded, uh, and you know, in the just since November has gone up five x. What the heck is happening? And do you do you have thoughts on what this phenomenon is and what it says about becoming richer and wiser and happier? Well, I, I think one of the fascinating things is just how unpredictable it all was. So if if you go back to um, say late, uh, well, a, a little more than a year ago, there, there was a there's a great investor that I interview a guy called Matthew McLennan, who I write about a lot in this book, who oversees something like ninety billion dollars, and he's one of the smartest investors I've ever met, and he said. There was nobody in the world who was saying there's going to be a COVID disruption to the cycle. And he said that really highlights the fact that we truly don't know what the future holds. And, and one of the most consistent themes that I found in interviewing all of the great investors is they don't really try to predict the future. What, what they're really trying to do is, is, as one of them put it to me, it was Howard Marks, who's a famous investor, said, I'm trying to predict the present. I'm looking at the present and trying to understand it. And Bill Miller, another great investor, um, said to me just yesterday um, that he, he quoted a great line from the novelist V.S. Naipaul, who said, if you, if you seize the present, it gives you a tremendous insight into the future. And so instead of trying to predict the future and trying to say, well, the stock market's going to go up or, or the bond market's going to go down or, or inflation's coming or a pandemic's coming or this variant, what you really want to do is position yourself to survive in various states of the world. And so the focus on actually being resilient, building, building a resilient life and building a resilient portfolio becomes really important. And so what, what someone like Howard Marks, who oversees something like $120 billion and who, who I call the, the, the philosopher king of finance, he's a very brilliant guy. What he says is one of the keys to survival is simply not to overreach. And so, I mean, he's someone who's worth $2 billion according to Forbes, but but he's very conservative. And he says, for all of us, you want to live within your means. You don't want to have recurring expenses that make you vulnerable. One of the things Buffett says is, is you don't want to be dependent on the kindness of strangers or even of friends who suddenly have a, a liquidity crisis and can't bail you out. And so this, this idea of instead of trying to predict the future, trying to, trying to actually consciously reduce your fragility is very important and, and, and to think about your exposure. And, and so one of the things that I would just encourage people to do is to, is to ask themselves the simple question, where am I fragile? How do I reduce my fragility? Am I, do I have all of my money in one bank? Do I have it all in one country? Do I have it all with one investor? Do I have too much in one stock? Do I not understand that stock? And, and the less speculative you can be, the better, because you, you really want to position yourself as, as Matthew McLennan said, to survive the dips. And, and, and this period with, um, with COVID is a spectacular reminder that there are dips in any lifetime, whether it's, whether it's a, a, a pandemic or a problem in a marriage or a problem with a job where you get laid off. You, you, you need to live within your means and not have too much leverage, not have too much debt. 
So, so the first thing you want to focus on is actually survival. It's, it's resilience. It's making sure that you'll be okay, that you survive the dips. And it's, it's a very unsexy thing to say, but it's remarkable how consistently the greatest investors talk about this importance of, of just avoiding catastrophe, staying in the game, surviving the dips. Important advice, William. We have to we have to stay in the game so that we can live to fight another day. Focus exactly. on resiliency. It's fantastic. And I see a LinkedIn user here says, I can already tell I'm going to rewatch this and share it with my kids. So great. Oh, that's advice. great. Get your kids to start in investing early because once if you show them the compounding tables and you show them what will happen to say a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars um over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's amazing. And there's there's a chapter at the start of the book where I went to India with this extraordinary guy, Monish Pabrai. And he's talking to these kids in India who he takes from the poorest families imaginable and, and yanks them out of poverty by giving them this incredible education. They're very high IQ kids. And he, he says to them, so think about my daughter, Monsoon Pabrai, a wonderful name, who, um, who had $4,800 that she made from her summer job. And he said, if you... If, if if you were to, to invest that and you made, I think it was 16% a year for 60 years, the next 60 years, because she was something like 17 years old, how much would that be? And it turned out that the $4,800 went to something like $21 million. And you see these kids sort of wide-eyed just, and, and he said, uh, are, are you going to remember the power of compounding? And they all go, yes, sir. So, so if you can get your kids to start this game early, simply simply compounding over a very long period without blowing yourself out of the game, whether you're 20, 30, 40, or hopefully 11, is, is incredibly powerful. It's such good advice. I love that. And please ask your questions. Type them into the chat box for William Green. He's the author of Richer, Wiser, Happier. And he is going to share how you can apply the lessons from the world's greatest investors into improving our own quality of life. We want to welcome some new viewers who are tuning in. We're so glad to have Minx from Oakland. We have Fred, who's coming in from Tanzania. We have Zhao Yu from Toronto. So uh, welcome wow. to our Wonderful. global crowd. Wow. We love it. So, William, you were just mentioning Monish Pabrai, who is one of the investors that you feature in your book. And I was interested, you talk uh, at length about his strategy, and it, it seems kind of simple and kind of fascinating all at the same time. Uh, he, he calls his strategy cloning. Can you talk about what he is doing and why it has proved so successful? It's, it's a wonderful theme and an incredibly powerful tool that, that most people don't use. And, and what Monish basically figured out, he's this, he's this super high IQ guy. He, he did terribly at school. And then suddenly someone said, oh, by the way, you have 180 IQ. And he said it was like the horse being whipped suddenly. He said, he said you, you need someone to tell you that you have something in you. And, and so he became a successful technology consultant, built his own business. And then one day, he was, um, he was in Heathrow Airport and he's reading a book just to kill time. And he discovers Warren Buffett in this book. He's, it's a book by Peter Lynch. And he sees um, Buffett's returns, which was something like 31% a year over 45 years. And because he understands compounding and he's kind of a good mathematician, he thinks, well, what if I could figure out exactly what Buffett did? If I could reverse engineer it, replicate it, and relentlessly apply those rules in, in my life, in the way that I invest. And so he calls this cloning. And uh, you could call it mimicry, you could call it modeling, whatever you want. Uh, as I've mentioned in the book, it's a, it's a technique for people who actually care about winning, who aren't particularly proud about how you call it. And, and, and so what he did is he went and he really figured out the laws of investing that had been revealed by Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, really by just reading and then going for 20 years running to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And he's ended up becoming very close to Charlie Munger. He's a good friend of Charlie Munger's. But this idea of actually reverse engineering what people who are wiser and smarter than us have already figured out, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, is incredibly powerful. And, and he's done it in, in fascinating ways in multiple areas of his life. So when I was mentioning before that there were these kids who he went to who he was yanking out of poverty, he literally, that, that was a charity that was cloned. 
I mean, he went to he went to Bihar province, which which was described as the, the kidnapping capital of India. It was a pretty dangerous place where there was this genius school teacher who would pluck these kids out of poverty and very high IQ kids and would give them training to go to the Indian equivalent of MIT. And, and so Monish wanted to give this guy money because he thought it was so extraordinary. And the guy said, no, I can't expand. It's just 30 kids. I can't teach more. And so Monish said, well, can I, can I build what you're doing at an industrial scale? And so he actually cloned the charity and as a result has managed to yank thousands and thousands of families out of poverty by basically doing exactly the same thing that this guy had done on, on a grand scale. And, and there's, a, there's a moment that I describe in the book where I was, I was in Irvine, California with Monish. I also traveled with him for five days in India to these schools. But I was in, in his favorite Korean restaurant. He's eating this, this sort of spicy beef danger dish that he loves. And, and I said to him, why don't more people clone if it's so powerful? And he said, there's something in human DNA that actually makes us unable to clone for the most part, because we, we have this fantasy of being original. And he said, as a result, there's this low hanging fruit where if you say, well, what have these guys already figured out? You can just take these things that, that, that are just wide open. Um, and it's such a powerful idea that I've actually, I've applied it in, in small ways and big in my life. And I, I would really encourage you to do it because it's, it's, it's such low hanging fruit and so few people are doing it. And, and he, he applies it in every way. So for example, he had this $650,000 charity lunch with Warren Buffett and, and, and Buffett said to him, hang out with people who are better than you and you can't help but improve. And Monish to an extraordinarily ruthless and, and, and somewhat um, socially scary way will say to himself at the end of a meal, did I enjoy that meal? Does this person make me better or worse? And he said, if they make me worse, I'll never see that person again. I, I won't go out for another meal with them again. And it sounds really harsh, but actually if you have that filter where you've said, well, Buffett is part of Buffett's advantage is that he hangs out with an extraordinary group of people, good human beings. And we know that our social environment, our peer group has a tremendous impact on us. So if over the course of your lifetime, you decide, well, let me, let me really hang out with people who are ethical, who are decent, who are kind, who are generous, charitable, smart, wise, um, not reckless, you're tilting the odds subtly and maybe even not so subtly in, uh, to your advantage of having a successful life and career. That's great. And speaking of low hanging fruit, William, I just have to follow up quickly. What are the ways you've cloned things? Well, it's in some ways, even something is when you when you put up my website and it said williamgreenwrites.com. When I went to get a URL a few years ago, I could see williamgreen.com didn't come up. And so I look at Michael Lewis's website because he's a great writer. And I say, oh, michaellewiswrites.com. And so I cloned that. Um, that's a really small example. But when I was writing this book and I was originally trying to figure out how to write this book, I went to people like Michael Lewis's book, Malcolm Gladwell's books, Oliver Sacks books, these, these nonfiction writers who were extraordinary. And I reverse engineered their books in great depth. And so I really figured out, oh, well, okay, so there are these different techniques. So one of the things that Oliver Sacks, who's wonderful, does is he'll take these cases, these case studies, where he would be writing about a patient of his, writing about their brain in something like the, the, what became the film Awakenings. And he'll use that case and then will expand out from that case to philosophize. Then what someone like Malcolm Gladwell is doing is he's starting with the idea and then he's taking, he's taking characters and stories that illustrate the idea. And I initially went the wrong way and did the Oliver Sacks model, which wasn't right for me. And then gradually I realized, oh no, actually, what's really interesting here are the themes. And so if I can focus on a theme like cloning or a theme like, like not being a fool, like just trying to reduce standard stupidities and then find multiple examples of it, or, or a theme like deferred gratification and find multiple examples, that, that suits me better. And so, so one of the things to ask yourself when you're cloning, it's, it's not blind replication, it's not stupid senseless replication, it's taking the habits, the insights and the principles that really smart people have figured out. And then it's figuring out, well, how, do, how does that apply to my circumstance? How, what, what will work better in my circumstance? And so, for example, Gladwell will write a book like Tipping Point that's really one idea. My book is about 10 ideas or 15 ideas. It's very different. 
And so even when you're trying to clone, you end up being original despite yourself. So you're taking the best of what other people do, but you also, you have to do it in a way that's aligned with your own personality and with your own temperament and with your own talents. And so there's no point my trying to clone Tiger Woods, you know, I, it's just not going to work. Um, uh, not you know, maybe <laughs> not for you either, but, but for me to clone Michael Lewis or Malcolm Gladwell, not trying to be derivative, but try to understand what they figured out is a very profound thing. And I think, I think it makes us feel a little bit queasy because you start to think, well, it makes me really unoriginal. And what if I'm just derivative and banal? And, and actually that's a kind of superpower that if you, so what, what Monish said is, I'm a shameless cloner. He's like, the, the reason I can do it is that I don't have an ego about it. And, and so the ability to set aside your ego and say, actually, let, let me be a disciple of these people who are really, really wise. And one of the things that Munger does that's fascinating, because it's hard for Munger to find anyone who's as clever as he is, is he, he hangs out with what he calls the eminent dead. And so Munger is reading biographies of people like his hero, Ben Franklin, and cloning Ben Franklin. Or he's, he's reading, say, about, he's, he describes himself as a biography nut. So he's reading about people like, like Newton and Darwin. And one of the things he's cloning from Darwin is, is the desire to find disconfirming evidence. And so, it's, so what Darwin did with evolution, Darwin was a very devoutly religious guy. Evolution was not a theory that sat very happily with his friends, his community, with the, the religious principles and orthodoxy of the day. But Darwin had the courage to seek disconfirming evidence and, and, and be brave about it. And so one of the things that, that Munger and a lot of these great investors do is instead of trying to seek confirmation of what they already believe, which is what most of us do when we read the newspaper, he's actually, he's consciously trying to figure out why his most cherished beliefs might be wrong. And he said any year that he destroys one of his most cherished beliefs is a wonderful year. And if he's failed to do it, it's a wasted year. So, so to systematically try to figure out um, what people who, who are the eminent dead figured out, what other people who are alive who are smarter than you have figured out, and then, and then to clone it without ego and to apply it to your own life in a way that suits your temperament and skills, I, I think is a, is a hugely misunderstood and unappreciated opportunity for all of us, really. That's such interesting advice. I think helpful for all of us. If you are enjoying this conversation, please hit the like button uh, and hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from William Green's advice as well. You can learn more about William at williamgreenwrites.com. And of course, his new book is Richer, Wiser, Happier. If you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly conversations, you can go to doryclark.com and sign up to get my self-assessment. You can do a free self-assessment and you will be getting notifications about these conversations as well. William, I think we have time for probably just one more question, but it's one that's probably on just about everyone's mind. Minx says, okay, this is, this is so helpful. Um, it's great, of course, if you start investing when you're young, but mm, what if you're no longer quite so young? but you want to dive in right now, how would you get started? What, what would you advise for, for people who have bought into this, William? They want to be richer, wiser, happier. What should they do today? I think what, one of the most fascinating things is that all, almost all of these great investors that I interviewed, who are people who've beaten the market by a mile, most of them end up saying, yeah, but for most people, you should buy index funds. And so I think in some ways, there's great strength in being self-aware enough to know, well, am I wired to win this game? Do I have an informational advantage? Do I know more than other people? Is there an area that I know a lot about? Do I have a temperamental advantage? Am I unemotional and dispassionate, which, which tends to be a, a characteristic of all of the great investors? Or do I tend to get carried away when things are, when things are tough, when, uh, when the market's falling apart? Uh, do I get panicked when it's going up massively? Do I wanna jump on, on the bandwagon? And so knowing yourself and knowing whether you're actually equipped to win this game is a very powerful thing. And the wonderful thing about investing is that there's this great default option, which is if you don't think you're equipped to beat the market and you don't think that you, you necessarily um, have the time or inclination to, to, to you know, 
try really to devote your life to, to beating this uh, the indexes, which is very tough, then you can really just go to a company like Vanguard, which has extremely low expenses. I mean, you can you can buy something like the 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 Vanguard International Fund Index Fund or the Vanguard Total Market Stock Index Fund, which is the whole U.S. market. You'll be charged 0.14 of a percent a year, something like that. And I interviewed Jack Bogle, who who was the founder of Vanguard, which now manages 6.2 trillion dollars. And he said to me, the mathematics of indexing were just so obviously right because he said. Basically, if you have a middleman, as he called it, a croupier, who's skimming off something from the top and is is sort of you know putting their hand in your pocket, taking out one percent, one and a half percent a year, he said it really adds up. And so he he actually went through the math and he said, if if I, I think it was if you invested a million dollars over thirty years and you made ten percent a year, it went to something like seventeen and a half million dollars because of the power of compounding. And if you basically spent one and a half percent of that a year on expenses, so it's eight point five percent a year over thirty years, you made eleven and a half million. So you gave back six million dollars over the course of thirty years in expenses because that one point five percent a year is compounding against you. And so these very simple principles, like like investing with a very long term horizon. So you keep adding to the market, you take advantage of tax advantage vehicles like IRAs or 401ks or 529 plans. And then you don't panic, you don't keep coming in and out of the market, you just keep adding. And you keep your expenses low. That's so powerful that you're going to end up beating 80% of people anyway. So so I, I, I hope that's a way to start. And there are other principles that I talk about in the book. And you know, look, if you think you're someone who can win win this game, there are principles in there where I show how people like Monish Pavra and Charlie Munger do it. But for most of us, un unless unless you really have that expertise and that temperament, it's a very wise precaution just to invest in index funds in a in a fairly diversified way. One, two, three index funds. So you're you're in U.S. market and international markets, and then just keep adding to it intermittently, especially when the market gets hit. So especially at a time like this where people are getting carried away and the market's done very well for a while, don't get carried away. And and if it and if it plunges, then just keep adding. Uh, you know, I, Bill Miller, who's one of the great investors, said to me, maybe I was dropped on my head when I was six months old, but I believe that lower prices are better. And and so take the opportunity when the market gets hit, where there are dips, five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, where you you just keep adding. That that. You, you'll beat almost everyone just by just by applying those simple principles. It's 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 like health. If if you if you exercise a bit and you eat well and you don't drink too much and you meditate a bit and and you have good relationships, you're going to be so much healthier than if if you know you you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken every day. The, the truth is not that complicated. That's the that's the embarrassing thing, but it's also really helpful for us. Amen to that. This is great advice that all of us can apply today. William Green is the author of Richer, Wiser, Happier. Thank you all so much for tuning in. You can join us again next Thursday at the same time. It is 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, and 5 p.m. in London. And we are going to be interviewing Greg McEwen, the author of the new book, Effortless, and the old book, uh, The Million Seller Essentialism. We're looking forward to that. But William Green, thank you so much for joining us with your insights today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for the questions, everyone. That was lovely.